So we are now um, looking at Module 3 this week. There will be a lot of discussion around knowledge building principles. I'll probably be doing a shortened version of the PowerPoint that's in here, but I will spend some time showing you where all the resources are because you're going to use a lot of resources to do this assignment. We're basically going to ask you to look at all the knowledge building principles and build your own ebook about it using VoiceThread. So I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. Let us do Module 3 for Monday, June 5th. But before we start there, let me make sure we understand how we were doing Module 2. So in Module 2, I asked you to kind of, not kind of, I asked you to synthesize your thinking about the ideas around teaching and learning online and how we do it. Remember, we are in uh, belief mode here. And so the question was, how do I get this, we'll use pages, how do we get this out and into our Schoology class? It's really quite easy. You go to the arrow at the bottom of your voice thread. You copy the link. And then you go into our Schoology course, and that link is located in the Module 2 itself. Right here. This is all the directions about how to join up. Here's the link. Unfortunately, it doesn't open it right away. You have to click on that link. Sign in with how you logged in or, or signed up, excuse me. Okay. And it takes you into here. We're going to come down here to the bottom where it says reading and discussion with voice thread for module two. And it drops me in here where I'm now ready to make a post. So I'll write a comment. My post and voice thread. And right down here is a little linky thing. I'm going to click on that link. And this is where I now will paste in that link I got out of VoiceThread. And I will give it a title. I'm going to go ahead and, and title this one Page, because she was sweet enough to let me borrow this. And then I'm going to attach, and I'm going to post. So what I've done is I now have a way that I can get to the voice thread that uh, I created. 
very simply. Okay, as you can see here, uh, let's see. Here's another example of a voice thread. And when you do this, it is as simple as getting that link and then putting that link into a post into the Schoology. All right, let me move on now to Module 3. In module 3, this is our last module where we will be in belief mode. Believe it or not, you're almost done with what you need to do for this class. Uh, because when we get through with all of this, I'll spend uh, one module talking about quality matters, which is your framework for how you build your online course. And then we'll take a look at Schoology, which will be what we use for creating our online course. So we're kind of coming in on the home stretch here. Remember, the way I set this course up, though, it is running all summer long. So you have that much time. If you run into a problem, do not hesitate to email me. More importantly, text me, because that way you'll get a, a much more rapid response. All right, when we look at knowledge building principles, as you can see, this little image is everywhere in this class. And this is all about taking these ideas about constructivism, collaboration, ideas to the center, and questioning. Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Borreiter were the people who came up with the knowledge building principles. I knew them through the University of Toronto, where I did a lot of work. And they are people that uh, I have a great, great respect for. Well, I've just been told that there might be a class coming in here to where I'm sitting. So what I'll do is uh, I'll go ahead and stop the recording here, but I'm going to keep it because that was just a quick review of Module 2, and I'll label it as such in the, um, in the recordings listings. Let me keep going here for a little while. What Marlene and Carl were trying to understand was how do classrooms resemble expert learners' situations in industry? The idea was based upon research that you heard about in your Thomas Kuhn videos. Hold on a second, I'm going to stop this. Okay, so I'm going to have to leave here, and I'm going to keep this recording, and I'll just label it as a review of Module 2, and we'll pick up with Module 3. Okay, well, I hope you can hear me now. We are having a bit of an issue tonight because I got tossed out of the room that I thought I was going to be in. And so I've had to go back and restart and reload and, and do all the things you have to do to get uh, Collaborate to work. So right now it's telling me that it's waiting for my page application starts. So I'm going to go ahead and click off, click back on it, 
And my goodness, Collaborate is having issues tonight. That is a shame. Page that gets you caught up on what I did earlier when I was in the other room, and I will make it a part of the recording for tonight. I used your wonderful example of um, your voice thread that you made for module two, and I showed how to upload that into the uh, Schoology site. Have you uh, done that? Have you been able to put it up there yet? Right. Getting it into live text is the problem. So all you need to do in live text is take, do that same procedure you did to get it into the Schoology. In other words, go into your voice thread, copy the link. You go to the little arrow underneath your voice thread, copy link, and just go to live text and paste in that link. Okay? You can't you can't do a paste out of of uh, Schoology. You can in in uh, Edmodo, but you can't in Schoology. All right, I'm still working here to get uh, sharing going. And we'll see here if I finally get. I can't believe I'm having this much trouble. And we're recording all this time. <laughs> uh, and you can't see anything, right, Paige? You don't see anything on your screen? Just to collaborate? You don't see my screen coming through? Yep, mine says the same thing. Waiting for application sharing to start. All right, Paige, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit the Collaborate, and then I'm going to turn around and come right back in. So don't go anywhere. You stay in the room. I'll be right back. Gosh, Paige, I feel like I was just dressing in front of you. You, you got to see all the behind-the-scenes magic that goes on to put one of these uh, things together. Normally, I have all this up and running, you know, a good hour before the class starts. I'm going to jump back to Module 2 just so I can clarify your question. You can hardly hear me? How about that? Can you hear me now? I should be blasting into your, yeah, okay. I was going to say I should be blasting into you right now. So real quick, let's look at module two just so I can show you what your question was because you're the only one who's done something. Um, when I go in here and I click on this, what I'm doing is, is I'm going to be looking for your voice thread, which is right here. And then I go down here to where this little arrow is. It says share. And then I just click, click that, copy link. Now, if I go over to the live text and where we have module two, just then 
you know, control V or right click, paste, however you do it, edit, paste, and it will put it, you know, in there. Don't worry about it. Um, by default, Live Text doesn't know what to do with uh, links with URLs, and that's okay. Because what Stevie does is he goes in and he just highlights it and he right clicks on it and I tell it to open it in a new tab and it works. Okay, we're going to do module three. This is the glue. This is the last piece when we talk about the belief mode and design mode. This is the last piece of belief mode. Actually, we have just a couple of more pieces left, and that's Quality Matters and then using Schoology, and we're pretty much done. Um, no, don't put it in as a comment. Sorry. Don't put it in as a comment. Go in and use the template, and then below where all the writing is where I say this is what you do, then just, just paste it in there. As I said, I want to all see it and I'll know what to do with it when I see it. Does that make sense? All right. So this is the last piece of the belief mode. In belief mode, we're basically building an understanding of how online can be used to teach. Unfortunately, as I keep saying over and over again, the whole idea of module one, besides just ticking you off, was to show you what old online and pretty much what present online looks like. What we're trying to get at is this, knowledge building principles, and they are at play in an online environment. Now, next week when we look at Quality Matters, Quality Matters is a framework. It's a, did you do this? Okay, now do this, now do this. It's still, it's not the philosophical or theoretical underpinnings. It is a framework. It is a coloring book, if you will. This is how you do this, and this is what you put here. Knowledge building principles, to me, is the heart and soul of this whole course. Knowledge building is an idea that was created by two researchers, Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Bereiter. I got to work with Marlene and Carl about 20 years ago? 20 years ago? Yeah, I guess it's been that long. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the University of Toronto working with them. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the uh, code, code writers of a program called Knowledge Forum. Uh, this was long before such things as MySpace and Facebook ever existed. What we were trying to do was to develop uh, a way for kids to have an experience that people in professional learning groups experience all the time. Marlene came from a background, neither one of these people, well, Carl is, a, is truly an educator. Carl is in the top 100 educators of the 20th century. He's right in there with Dewey. Um, he came out of the University of Chicago where he uh, created the reading series that um, you probably have heard of. And in his research with watching how kids learn to read, what he kept seeing over and over again, this was open court, by the way, I'm sorry. What he was seeing was that kids were able to read but without any understanding. And in my early work as a teacher, I got a reputation for being an excellent reading teacher. I could teach anybody to read. In fact, there's a video out there of me teaching people to read, and the line was, he could teach a rock to read. I used to work with adults who were illiterate who could not read. But the thing that always baffled me was I could go in and using a phonetic and whole word approach, I could get people to read, but I could not get understanding. Now, Understanding is different than context, okay? Context is you can go in and read a passage and answer some questions, okay? But understanding means you have taken the reading and you have put it into a context of your own experience and you get it, which is what real learning is all about. Real learning is all about understanding and applying. 
that's what the guys um, understanding by design guys, Wigan and McTeague, uh, postulate. I firmly believe that. So here's Carl, and he's, he's trying to understand why this doesn't work. And then along comes Marlene, who is also a researcher, and she's researching why don't kids learn in the environment that school offers. Now, you know, we can say, well, that's not true. There's plenty of kids who learn well in school. Well, those are kids who come from backgrounds where school is important, where kids are motivated to do well in school. But then when you actually look at how kids are by the time they get done with school, they're very good at school. That's what the SAT measures. They're not very good at understanding and applying. Their research focused on a group of professional learners, people who did research and development, R&D, in industry, and in professions your professional organizations, your doctors, your nurses. And one of the things that they're very cognizant of is that knowledge is an always moving target. They always have to be up to date on the latest equipment or the latest uh, procedures. And so they started researching how those people worked to come to understandings and applications. And did it have any application? Did it have any place in education? That's what they did their research on. And so their research in knowledge building is based on these four pillars that you see in this little graphic I always put up here. Constructivism, people are always building knowledge based upon prior knowledge. And then that new knowledge comes out of that, a new construction which then can change again. Real knowledge should be changing all the time, which is really kind of hard to get into your head because we have a tendency to think about there are certain things that are immutable, that nothing will ever change about them. In fact, we have whole uh, political philosophical arguments around the idea that things like the Constitution is set in stone and never changes. But all you got to do is go back and look through the history and you see it changes all the time. The second one is collaboration. No one of us is any smarter than all of us. The groups that do the most interesting work are the groups where true collaboration goes on, where people really genuinely change ideas and challenge ideas and test theories and then retest theories. Now, I'm not talking here scientifically. I mean, you see this all the time put kids in a group and assign them a language arts uh, assignment and then watch how they approach the assignment. Someone will say, well, Mrs. Smith said this. Well, can we do it this way? Mrs. Smith, can we do it this way? Mrs. Smith, if she's a good teacher, will say, sure. And they'll go back and they'll try something again. Ideas to the center is extremely hard for people to get their heads around in education because we have been so well trained, trained is the right word, not instructed, to follow the curriculum guide. Now, the thing that we always get pushed back on this idea from uh, teachers and uh, other professional organizations is we just want the kids to just do anything they want. Nope, never said that, never said that, never said that. What we are saying is we take the curriculum we allow kids to explore the ideas of that curriculum and then going to the Wiggins and McTeague definition of good curriculum, kids demonstrate their understanding by application. I'll give you a good example. So I saw a young lady at um, no middle school who was trying to teach quadratics to her kids. And if you don't know what quadratics are, they're the area under a curve, or can be. That's one of the things you use it for. And so she basically went through her teaching, explained how the formula works, et cetera, et cetera. And then she challenged the kids to develop a fountain for in front of the school there at No. And so what did they have to do? 
Well, first of all, they had to find out what kind of space are we talking about. So they went out one day and they took turns working in groups to find the radius. She wouldn't let them do a circle. Wouldn't let them do a diameter. They had to do a radius. And then they brought it back in and then they started designing. How high would it shoot the water? Well, using quadratics then, we can find out then the curve and how far out then it would shoot and how far out it would fall. So then we have to think about how much pressure do we use to push that amount of water up? How do we know that? Well, let's go find out. This is moving ideas to the center. The ideas about the curriculum move to the center. Give you another example. How do you do projections of population, population projections? We do samples. How do you get kids to understand that? Well, you give them a topic. How do we know that 500,000 people attended Thunder Over Louisville? Well, the first thing you ask kids to theorize is, what is your theory? Moving the ideas to the center. Kids will say, uh, they flew around in a helicopter and counted the number of heads. They counted the number of people that went through a turnstile. Someone walked along the waterfront and counted the number of people. Uh, each one of the buildings that people go in and watch the water, watch the fireworks, reports out how many is in it. Good ideas. Good ideas. Now teach. Oh. So you do a sample and then you do a projection. Oh, so now kids were given that. And then they were given the challenge of come up with your own example of what a sampling problem might look like and take us through your thinking. Moving the ideas to the center. And finally, questioning. Question, question, question everything. There's never a question that's too dumb to ask. There's never a question that is too simple to research. In fact, the simplest questions are probably some of the best research that you can do. As you can see, some people will say that the knowledge building principles are tied very closely to the scientific method. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's fairness in that statement. Um, the idea that we come up with a hypothesis and then we come up with a theory about that hypothesis. I think this is the reason why that happens. Or I think this is the reason why when Hemingway was writing the way he was telling his stories that he wrote in his very truncated prose. You know, it, it runs up and down the uh, curricular gambit. I mean, I've, I've been in second grade classes where kids will say, why do caterpillars go hide in chrysalis? Why do moths go hide in cocoons? My theory is they need a place. One of my best ones I saw was a kid said, um, butterflies and moths are shy animals, so they need some place to go so they can hide and change their clothes. Second grade now. And so then, of course, teach, teach, teach. Now go back and revisit your initial hypothesis and tell us what you think. Why do trees turn color? Well, we know that answer. We know that answer as adults. What we can do is we can either say to kids, well, it's because through photosynthesis, the sap isn't rising in the trees anymore, and so the minerals that are there in the leaves that were brought up through the process of uh, sap rising into the trees, um, that's now gone, and so those then show through as the colors we see in the leaves. So the chlorophyll goes away, leaves behind all of the minerals and other deposits, and that's why we see the colors we see. Now, we can do that with kids. Or we can go through a series of understandings and explorations so that they then see it, and more importantly, make the application of the knowledge that they have found. Now let me go into this module, and I'm going to spend just a little bit of time looking at this. This is the PowerPoint that I created many, many years ago um, as a part of my work in 
Toronto. And it's, it's that PowerPoint that basically talks about building the environment that allows for knowledge building to, under, to flourish. So the first thing we realize is that learning is an active, constructivist process. We know that. You know that. I know that. Um, is constructivism a theory? No, it's a reality. And it is a reality because every time we learn something new, we build upon the old. When we have to learn something new, a new device is put in front of us and we have to figure it out. We fall upon old in the sense of, is there an instruction manual here? Oh, wait a minute. This is the button that I use on this other thing that I play with, so it must be the same thing. And depending upon how you're structured in your brain, you go at this different ways. It's still all valid. We build models. And what's really fun is when you see this tested, and I'll tell you where you see it is in schools. Go into a kindergarten class and watch a teacher talking about an idea that's new to kids. And listen to the crazy ideas that they come up with. It's not because they're stupid. It's because their constructist model of whatever she's talking about doesn't take into what she is describing. Once she makes those new neuron connections for them, then that's new information they have in their heads that they then can apply to other understandings. It's called divergent learning. All right. Let's keep rolling through here because I don't want to take too much time with this. Understanding is critical. Understanding is very much a process where we go through, where we have a theory about how things work. And again, this is not highfalutin. This is not a, you know, I believe. No. I think this. I think that. But you come up with an understanding. And then what you do through the use of curriculum, no, oh, here's a good quote. How many times have you seen a kid say that? We have to realize that understanding works best in that, in working in a collaborative mode. Because within the collaborative mode, then, we can have people share ideas and test those ideas and start to see how their ideas fit with the curriculum, with the partners, with the teacher. And then you work through an idea so that your idea becomes fully formed. And because you now have tested it and you have had it tested by others, you now believe in it. Look at this picture right here. This is the classic picture of, of Thomas Edison holding his little light bulb. Western culture has this idea about the lone worker, the lone scientist, just squirreled away somewhere thinking through problems. And it's totally false. If you look at the second picture here on the right, this is the real picture. This is his Menlo Park Research Lab, where he had hundreds of guys, engineers, craftsmen, that we're working on solving the light bulb problem. No one of us is any smarter than all of us. It's all how you build the classroom to allow for this to happen. Knowledge advancement is based upon improvable ideas by asking high-level questions. Everything is improvable. Everything is improvable. I just got through watching WWDC today where the good folks at Apple were showing off all their latest, greatest things. And when you watch stuff like that, it's not just Apple. When you watch Microsoft or Samsung or any of these other corporations that do this little stand-up and, and uh, show, you're, you're struck by how much further can you, oh, oh, I never thought about it doing it that way. Oh, really, you're going to do that. So everything is improvable. Otherwise, we'd all be sitting around um, around fires, figuring out how to go kill the next meal. 
Mendel worked on Karen's question. Knowledge advancement is also based on a thorough understanding of what you don't know. Real knowledge advancement comes when a kid can sit there and say, I get this part, don't get that part. How does my part fit into, my understanding, how does it fit into what either the group that I'm in is working or how does it fit into what the teacher is saying? If we could get kids just to be able to enunciate that very simple idea, this is what I understand, and this is how it, I think it fits, and this is what I don't understand. We go a heck of a long way toward making teaching a lot easier for us all. Okay, I'm going to stop this because I keep showing you this. By the way, all of these kids that you see in these little videos um, are kids that were from Louisville here. Uh, and we basically, over the years, we had an enormous... Uh, knowledge building uh, project here in Jefferson County back in the day. And it was one of the things I was probably the most proud to be a part of, um, having been uh, a part of the work up at the University of Toronto. So I'm going to take you into how the module kind of works and show you where things are that you're going to use to build your understanding of the knowledge building principles. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging with nothing to work with. Let's make that clear. So the first place I want you to go into is this right here, knowledge building principles explained videos. These are some good friends of mine who um, I worked with at UT. Um, UT has a, a college of education they call OISI, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And a lot of these folks are good friends. Uh, the people you'll see in a lot of these videos, uh, Richard and Glenn and Bev, again, like I said, I've, I've known all these good folks, Carol. I want you to go into 12 principles of knowledge building. And what you're going to see is you can either read it and I'll come back to this. I'll show you mine. The one I wrote was on epistemic agency. Well, let's just go through them real fast. So under improvable ideas, our ideas are treated as improvable rather than simply accepted. So, yeah, I get it, but have we ever thought about this? You know where you see this a lot is in good math classes. Kids will sit there and they'll come up with all kinds of different ways of solving a problem. Improvable ideas. There's Stevie's. Epistemic agencies. Learners are given agency to set goals, engage in long-range planning, Monitor progress, evaluate idea coherence, support sustained knowledge advancement. Learners are empowered to take charge at the highest levels. What we're saying here is we are giving you the freedom, if you want, to explore your ideas, to set goals about them, and then to research them, and then to understand what you know and what you don't know and how you can um, sort them out. Ignore these knowledge forum supports. That's the specific to the software that we used to run. Um, democratizing knowledge basically means that all the participants can see what everyone else is doing, and they take pride in the knowledge advances that they can generate. Idea diversity, there's no one right answer. Idea advancement depends upon the diversity of ideas. Oh my goodness gracious, we have so destroyed that. Knowledge building in the discourse. It's not just sharing practices, it's understanding how to share. You don't go in and go, well, your idea is stupid. You go in with something called the PQP, which is praise, 
question propose. I really liked your idea, Paige. I think it makes sense in what we're trying to do here. <laughs> yes, revision does end in death. Um, I really like what you're doing here. Question. Have you ever thought about it this way? And then I would go on to say wherever this way was. And then propose. How about if we look at it together and see what we can come up with? You have to teach kids how to do that. It doesn't happen naturally. What usually happens naturally is, your mama, that's stupid. Oh, what did Jane put in? That's what I'll put in because she's the prettiest girl in the class. What did George put in because he's the biggest uh, football player? Yeah. Or what did John put in because he's the nerd? Depends upon the clique I guess you're in. But if we can get that discourse going where people talk to each other. Real ideas, authentic problems. This gets to the sort of the uh, essential question idea. How do we ask a, a question that is open-ended but yet based on something that kids can really work at and think about? Marlene calls this shallow constructivism versus deep constructivism. Shallow constructivism is that sort of, hey, what would it be like to live on Mars? Well, what data do we have? So the question might look more like, if we were going to try to establish a colony on Mars, what would we need to understand and how could we build that colony to exist on Mars? It isn't just the, it's not because it's a longer question. It's that the thinking that would be involved in that points us to where we need to go. A rise above is where, I always think of rise above as, and you always see these. Some kid will come in and he'll say, so are we talking about that it means this? He simplifies. Are we talking about that it transcends the original idea? It rises above the original idea and works toward a more inclusive idea that would bring all ideas together under an umbrella of one. Boy, you see this a lot in uh, group work in like uh, science classes. A lot of that. Constructive uses of authoritative sources. This is where we try to get kids to evaluate and critically evaluate the sources they want to use uh, in their thinking. Uh, we don't just go out and hit wiki spaces. We try to find sources that actually have something that gives us ideas. And per pervasive knowledge building. This one, um, people always said to me, I've never seen this. And I laugh and I go, I see it all the damn time. I see kids talking about new information. And then if you listen very closely, you'll hear them going through the process. So what's this new thing? Did you know you could do this on your phone? No. What is this thing you're talking about? Well, there's this thing called Instagram that will allow you now to make a video, and you can record it and post it into Instagram. Really? How does that work? Well, my theory is, dun, 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 dun. try it. Hey, did you also know you could add a little goofy picture in that Instagram? No, I did not. Let me show you how. And this pervasive knowledge building that you just heard there in that little example you see it all the time. It's just there under the surface with most kids. We just have to structure it. And that's what an online class should be doing, is structuring these principles into a framework. And the framework that we're going to use is Quality Matters. Symmetric knowledge advancement, expertise is attributed within and between communities and team members. Team members. Paige is the expert on that. Let's go ask Paige. Hey, Paige, did you know how to? Hey, Paige, do you know this? Okay. Paige gives us the information that she knows. Huh, I didn't know that. Let me go back and try that out. Hey, everybody, did you know such and such and such and such? No, I didn't. Where would you get that idea from, Paige? Well, let's check that out. Hey, that makes sense. 
embedded concurrent and transformative assessment. Oh, oh boy. Um, what I find so fascinating is, is once you get an online class rolling, the assessment that happens within it quickly, quickly can move from the formative module one that you went through to something more that looks like synthesis analysis and presentation of understanding. Now, let me back out of here and take you to an even better way of looking at this. And forgive me, I have to find it real fast. I think it's this one. It's the same one. Um, now, these are all PDFs. We have videos in here. I just have to find it. <laughs> well, we have so much. <laughs> That's our problem. Let's see if this one is it. Nope. Okay, let me go back a page. This was in 2014. I have a feeling that we need to go back home, go to resources. As you can see, uh, we've been doing this a while. Since 2005. But even before that, like I said, I've been involved with it way back at the very beginning. Let's see if uh, this is what I'm looking for. This is one of the resources we can use. In this knowledge age, the health and wealth of the country is strongly related to the innovative capacity of the people. Engaging our students in knowledge building is one way to develop citizens who are future ready. For example, why is the sky blue? Learners' ideas surrounding this question communicate their conceptions of color, reflection, refraction, or wavelength. Okay, now, that's very much a good, um, oh, there it is, it's right there, blue. Uh, this is very much a video that I want you to watch because it does that nice visual on the process that I just kind of walked you through. And what I want you to keep thinking about is, as you go through this, is when you get to the actual building of something that looks like a design that will be your <coughs> classwork, you now have an amazing guide in terms of the things to look for. The quality matters just gets you a here it is. Finally found it. It's at the bottom of the page. Page. And the, the thing that I want you to realize is quality matters is just a framework. Knowledge building is the true content. Let's run this. <coughs> this will actually walk through each one of the principles. In a knowledge building classroom, it's about the community. The community having a responsibility to create a sort of a collective knowledge. Everybody has ideas. Okay. That was Richard Messina who started out. This is my dear friend Richard. And then this is the brain right here. This is Marlene Scardamalia, a beautiful, beautiful thinker. Uh, I have the deepest love and respect for her. Everybody can know ideas. If you really want to get started in knowledge building, the key fundamental idea is making sure that the kids are going to ask questions that they feel are the most authentic to them. You can ask them to And for me, that's huge because a happy student will learn. The students uh, couldn't believe that we would send people on a one way trip to Mars. What will they do for water? How will they serve up? You know how you feel owed is when you see all these people and know that you trained them. That's how you, you feel low. Us having the brain dump of all of our ideas and our fears and our wonders and we're putting them all into a big pot and then we improve on them. The challenge is producing knowledge of value to the community. It starts with the natural tendency to play with ideas, but it extends to this really hard 
piece of continually improving your idea. And the students to see that their learning was progressing. Uh, for some of the students, they hadn't had that experience before. Um, they just sort of went through each year and didn't realize, wow, I used to think this, and now I think this. It challenged me of like thinking about, is that one possible, is that possible? Why would it be possible? Why would it not be possible? So how could we figure out how many different designs we can make? It's kind of tricky. Our class is a knowledge building community. The students, everything happens through discourse and, and through collaboration. We create it. Okay, I'm not going to make you sit there and okay. listen to this group. It gives everyone a chance to listen. This microphone essentially uh, recording that. Now, when they get over here to the knowledge form piece, yeah. That is the software that we designed that we use to do all this with. But if you think about when we get into designing inside of Schoology, I can do all of this that you see here inside of an online site like Schoology. Okay? So this is called Cecil Knowledge Form. Don't worry about it. Um, it is pretty much um, a piece of software that's, frankly, not in a lot of use right now. Not because when we were developing it, uh, the, the money to develop it kind of uh, dried up, which is a shame because it was a beautiful, beautiful um, process. Okay, so you are going to try to put all this together to make sense. You have tons and tons of resources here. You could start with something like this document that I showed you right away. You can watch all of these videos that talk to you about each one of the uh, principles. Let me make sure you know where we are. I am in knowledge building, inquiry-based learning. And I'm just going to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, just like I did before. And this is my good friend, Bev. Knowledge problems arise from efforts to understand the world. Ideas produced or appropriated are considered as real as concrete objects that are touched and felt. Problems are ones that learners really care about. They are usually very different from problems presented in textbooks and puzzles. I think one of the other things to um, engage students in. Okay. So what you'll hear is Richard, he basically defines it for you. All ideas are treated as improvable. Participants work continuously to improve the quality, coherence, and utility of ideas. For such now, I want to make sure you see this, because this is where it lives. Um, and you see a variety. I don't know. Idea diversity is essential to knowledge advancement, just as biodiversity is essential. I've taken everything from both answers and making, making your kind of statement on that. Each person. Okay. And then, like I said, here's my baby. Participants set forth their ideas and negotiate how they fit or compare with the ideas of others. They seize upon contrasting or different ideas to help them deepen their understanding instead of depending on others to chart that course for them. They take responsibility for issues, such as goal setting. Okay. So, what then are, am I expecting you to do with this? So if we go in here and we look at all of this stuff that we have, this is a heavy, heavy assignment. I do not, you know, I'm fully aware of what we're up against here. So in the voice thread, what I want you to do is I want you to try to synthesize in your mind how you would go about creating a voice thread that has to do with the 12 knowledge building principles. Now, I'm not going to dictate to you what that looks like. Now, if you're very, very concrete sequential, it'll be 12 slides. And each slide has the principle, a definition, and how you see it fitting into a classroom. Let me say that again. You can do it with 12 slides about each principle, a definition, and how it fits into the classroom. Now, you can do this 
several ways. You can go in and you'd be surprised. You could be surprised. If you went into something like the Google and you typed in knowledge building advancement and told it then to find images, it will find images. And what you can do then is you can use this as a graphic for your slide on knowledge building advancement. In other words, you can literally go in and take each one of the titles of these things and put them in a Google and find an idea. Download the graphic, put it into your VoiceThread slide, and then you can record everything else. You also could do it by going into PowerPoint, putting in the definition, copy paste, putting in the definition into 12 slides, uploading the whole PowerPoint and putting it into the VoiceThread, and then going back and making comments on each one of the slides as to how you see the fit. Now, when I say the fit, what I'm saying is, how do we see this principle in a classroom? How would we like to see it in a classroom? And so that when we actually get around to looking at this through the framework lens of quality matters, then how can I have social discourse going on inside my Schoology site? Well, that's so obvious, it's not even funny. You build a discussion forum. You just create a place where kids can share ideas. The trick then becomes, how do you frame that to give them something to chew on that builds that discourse? So all of this stuff is not hard. It just requires you to think. So you can do a 12 slides PowerPoint. You can either just copy paste in the definition, load it into voice into VoiceThread, and then comment on each one of the principles as how you see it fitting into the framework of an online classroom. The other way you could do it would be you could go out and find graphics that represent each one of the knowledge building principles put those into a PowerPoint, load the whole thing in, and then just have a comment and another comment about the definition and the best fit. Okay? So you're going to build an ebook for yourself that is your way of trying to make sense of this massive amount of stuff that Steve has thrown at you realizing you have so much material here to work from. When you go to this link and you see the knowledge building, you have all these resources down here. If you need something to read and or copy, so I would basically go in here and copy that, and I would put that over into my PowerPoint slide. I got that. Then I would come down here to the bottom where all those videos were, and then I would listen to the people who know this better than anybody, the teachers and the students, to make sense of it, and then I would construct my understanding of what I think the knowledge building principle is and its fit into an online classroom. Okay, I'm going to close up shop here because i got to start another class in 15 minutes. Uh, Paige, how did I do? Were you able to follow? Does it make sense? Yep, good. All righty. Um, as always, if you need me, it's 457-2937, 502-457-2937. Hey, Paige, give us a testimony. When you ask me questions uh, through the... Uh, SMS, do you get a quick answer?
Okay, how do you do that? That's a really good question, Paige. Can we go back and look at that real fast before I let you out of here? Um, that module one, the problem with it is, first of all, Paige, did you get a, um, did it give you a certificate when you went in there? No. All right. Okay, so let me go here. Yep, I see it. It says there are no new achievements. Okay, that's not your fault. That's, I don't know what's up with Blackboard. So all I need you all to do is if you will go in to your grade and page, were you able to see your grade? Okay. If you'll just go into the live text and say, I earned my certificate, because <laughs> I can look it up. I mean, I can look up the scores and see. I thought I put the link. I thought, Paige, if you went into your grade, because you have a grade center, you could look it up there. But don't worry about it. Just tell me that you did it. Oh, okay. I can grade them. That's not a problem. Just tell me you did it. And then I can double check that with the Grade Center. Okay? All right. You all take your time with this. As I said, you're building your own ebook that is your understanding of the knowledge building principles. When I come back on here next Thursday, we will take a very deep dive into Quality Matters. Remember, quality matters is nothing more than the framework. And if you, when you look at the rubric and when you look at the standards, it's going to be, do this standard. Do I have that covered in my um, online? Yes. Do this standard. Do I have it covered? Yes. That's easy. The hard part is then thinking back to how does what you're doing in your online course reflect these knowledge building principles. That's it, kids. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thank you, Paige, for being here.